Nigerians are yet to come to terms with the recent increase in fuel pump price, reacting to the fresh increase in the pump price of fuel from 160 naira per litre to 168 naira per litre. The president of the Nigerian Labour Congress, NLC, Dr. Yuba Waba, has asked the federal government to reverse the increase in pump price, saying the action is condemnable. He described the recent increase in the pump price of petrol as a breach of spirit and content of what the organized labor agreed with the government at the last negotiations over the last fuel price increase. In a statement yesterday, Waba said the Congress has asked its affiliate unions in the petroleum industry for updates on how the federal government had kept to the agreement reached with labor to enable it to decide on the next line of action. According to him, there is disquiet in the land over the extraordinary level of inflation in the country. He added that the recent increase in pump price of fuel has only exacerbated the sufferings of people whose standard of living is dropping by the day. He said one of the measures NLC is proposing for the government is to declare a state of emergency in our downstream sector of the petroleum industry. All right. Meanwhile, the federal government has been explaining the reason for the adjustment coming barely two months after the first increase. The Minister of State for Petroleum Resources attributes the hike to the recent announcement of a possible vaccine for COVID-19. Through Pre Silver told reporters that the news of the vaccine for COVID-19 by Pfizer caused crude oil prices to go up, which brought about the adjustment in the pump price. Tundu, we're here again. We're here a couple of months ago. Now we're here again. Another increase. What's your take on this? I mean, are you surprised by it, though? I'm not. But what I want to say is that I disagree with the rationale advanced by the Minister of State for Petroleum, uh, Mr. Silver, saying that we have to be fair to the poor because kerosene and diesel were deregulated a long time ago and that that is what the, po what the poorest of us use kerosene and that diesel is what is used to transport you know, food from across the country, all those trucks. But I actually disagree with that, to be honest with you. Even the very poorest of us, who he's seeking to protect, who he's seeking to be fair to, are going to be adversely affected by an increase in fuel price. Of course, there's a causal relationship between increase in fuel, fuel price and transport price, which you mentioned yesterday. Food costs, the costs of goods, services. So if we're trying to be fair to the poor, I'm not sure that this is the right way to go. Frankly, well, I think that uh, <clears throat> the position of organized labor, let's look at it first. Organized labor has been very consistent in insisting that uh, if you have, if you are a petroleum producing country and you produce crude oil, uh, perhaps if you refine locally, uh, you will not uh, have to incur such a high cost. Because when you say you are pegging the cost, of uh, petrol, which is the derivative of crude oil, to the international spot price of, uh, of crude, uh, then, of course, if you produce at home, perhaps it is better uh, that way to reduce costs. Some other people argue from the government side that the margin may not be that much. But the uh, NLC has been very consistent in saying, OK, why don't you just refine at home? And uh, the president of the NLC brought that up. If you are going to refine at home, well, maybe take a look at the system, the mechanism for licensing modular and bigger refineries. And he made one point, that you cannot hand over the uh, fate or the future of Nigerians with regard to local refining on one man or one entrepreneur. Of course, the innuendo in that regard is very clear. And I guess in that regard, he was referring to the Dangote refinery, which you know, we have been told that once it comes on stream, it will reduce the, the pressure. But could you do a lot more? Second, Ali Waba was calling for uh, the declaration of emergency in the downstream sector. Uh, what he means by that, uh, you know, he didn't quite uh, explain. But he was very clear on the point that you raised, that, look, if uh, the pump price of fuel continues to go up, then, of course, it will, it will be greater hardship on the people. Of people course. who are suffering from you know, the effect of the restrictions of the lockdown as a result of uh, COVID-19. People who are facing uh, inflation, headline inflation now, uh, there was one report saying it's already about 14.3%. And that the responsibility of government, in the view of organized labor, should be to do whatever it is possible to reduce the hardship of the people and not to add 
for that right. But if you look at the argument by the uh, Minister of uh, State for Petroleum, I think his strongest argument is that this time around, what has happened is that with the announcement by Pfizer of the uh, discovery of the uh, arrival of a, you know, likely a vaccine uh, for COVID-19, and then, you know, after Pfizer, there was also uh, Russia announcing that it has a Sput Sputnik V, which has been tested to be about 92 uh, percent effective. According and then yesterday, uh, Moderna, another U.S. firm, uh, coming on the heels of Pfizer, announced 94.5 percent. The logic that the minister was putting forward is that, look, with all of this, there is greater optimism in the world. There is the hope that things will improve. And you recall that when Pfizer made its own announcement, uh, stock, the stock market appreciated. Uh, you know, oil prices, uh, crude oil price jumped up by about 5.8% uh, in some accounts. Some accounts said by about 8.6%. So as a result of that, the, uh, the spot price of uh, crude went up. And if we are benchmarking the uh, pump price of uh, petrol to the international price of crude, then, of course, you know, the cost will go up. But the thing is this uh, lack of trust between government. When government said in March that now going forward, market forces will determine the pump price of fuel. OK, Nigeria said, let us see it. And then since then, oil prices have been very volatile. But the real fear now is that someday, when everything normalizes, we may end up paying as much as 200 naira, 500 naira for a liter of petrol. And Nigerians cannot even imagine that possibility. So that's where the problem is. And some people have pointed out that there were times when uh, oil, uh, uh, spot price of crude went down and there was no adjustment from that. PPMC. Yes. But why is it that it's, the thing is always on an upward uh, trajectory and PPMC and the other uh, bodies, they seem to, uh, you know, to lose sight of, the, uh, of their own logic. And I think that that's one area that government uh, needs to look at. But, you know, uh, Timmy Prisci was saying that it's the poor uh, that suffers, even if you don't remove a, a fuel subsidy, and that when you have a fuel subsidy regime, it is the rich that benefit from it. That's his argument. Yes. And that in any case, why don't you just do a general deregulation so that everyone can be uh, on the same uh, template? But, but should we suffer, uh, the ordinary Nigerian would uh, say, for the inefficiency of NMPC, for the inefficiency of government, for the failure of government to get the refineries working, and for the failure of government to pay attention to the welfare of the people. This These is are my, the questions. This is my problem. I, I, I mean, I think those arguments are, number one, very simplistic, because everybody uses petrol in this country. It affects you. I was telling exactly. you about the man that earns 30,000 naira that does service job in my house that comes from Ikorodu, spending 1,000 now every day of the week. So in a week, he spends about 6,000 naira on transportation, and it ends 30,000 at the end of the month. And PwC, per the report, said we've hit peak oil already, that the oil price will not go very higher than what we have already. The only way is down now. The, the only way is down. So what are the arguments he's making? I mean, it, it, it's up to challenge. That's all on news headlines. We'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll have Rotus, uh, Michael, Adesu, Amaro, and Aaron Akeja. Let's give us updates in Africa, global, uh, global business, and COVID-19. Stay with us. All right, welcome back uh, to the Rise News channel. And we've got our dependable Rotus Adiri to join us for Business Update this morning. It's a pleasure talking to you, Rotus. Good morning, uh, Rufai. Good morning, Tundu. Good morning, Doctor. Um, well, you've, uh, the three of you are already discussing uh, the comments from the Minister of State for Petroleum, uh, Timmy Pre Silva, uh, with respect to um, oil prices and the, the increase uh, that we've, the most recent increase that we've seen um, in uh, PMS. And of course, organized labor calling for a reversal. But I, I would like to focus on um, his justification for this most recent increase, where he said it has a result of uh, Pfizer. Let's listen. Are usually not static. It depends on the price of crude oil, which goes up and down. That is why we say deregulate, so that as the price go up or down, you begin to go up and down as well at the pump. Before now, we fixed it, which was not optimal for us as a country. So we say, look, our earnings are not fixed because our earnings are dependent on crude oil price. If we fix it at this end, 
then it becomes unsustainable at some point. So let us keep it floating so that if crude oil prices go up, then you will see a reflection of that. If crude oil prices go lower, you see a reflection of that at the pump. Now, what happened recently was because of the announcement of uh, a vaccine for COVID by Pfizer. With that, crude oil prices went up a little bit. If you've been following crude oil prices, you would have seen that crude oil prices went up a little bit as a result of this announcement. So when crude oil prices go up a little bit, then you will see that instantly reflect on the price of petrol, which is a derivative of crude oil. The, the, the Minister of State for Petroleum may be uh, a, bit, a bit disingenuous with his, uh, his logic there. Let's take a look at the charts, uh, this oil price chart here. And we'll look at the last four um, adjustments that we've seen in uh, prices. So if you look first to the left, April 1st, 100, when the price was reduced to 123.50, right? Now look to the next arrow, which is July 1st, when it was adjusted to 143. Pay attention to the crude oil charts, which is the blue line that's going across from left to right. Then look at September 3rd, when it was adjusted to 159. And then look at when the Pfizer announcement was made on November the 9th. The price, look, you can see the lag between each announcement, right? It's been more than a month. You had April, you got July, then you got September, and then this most recent increase. He's saying that the um, a price in PMS adjusted just after a week, when if in, historically uh, NMPC and the, the Petroleum Products Marketing Company, PPMS, have always said that, oh, look, we've got about 30 days of stock on hand whenever they try to calm down fear when it comes to uh, fuel price increases. Also, the pass-through effects of the, um, uh, the, the, the change in crude oil prices, the pass-through effect, when NMPC is being at its most efficient, it's about 30 days. I mean, it takes about a full month uh, where you'll see uh, an, a, a change in price. So also, if there was that quick of a change in PMS here in Nigeria from only a week after the Pfizer announcement was made, what about the um, CBN reporting an increase in the reserves, right, or an appreciation uh, in the Naira? So again, if you, if you think about the, 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 the vessels on the high seas, the amount of time it takes for them to dock when they now move from the, from the large oil tankers to the lighter vessels, which now from the lighter vessels now take on to the jetties, which the jetties now take on to the, ex, the, the depots, and then the demorage charges that they, that they incur when they are stuck at the high seas for a while. It takes a while for this pass-through effect um, to be seen. So, you know, and again, looking at this chart, if you see the lag between the, time, between the, the prices there, it does, eh, I don't know, that, that's not, uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't seem very accurate at all. And then if we look at the most recent price of... Um, of uh, crude here, I think we just had a, 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 about, it was about $44 a barrel. This was as a result of um, OPEC plus, Michael Wilson might mention this, OPEC plus technical meeting. They said that they are supporting a three-month extension of the cuts to production, right? And so that's most of the members looked at, they, they, are, they, are, they want to extend those cuts to keep uh, production down. Um, crude moved about 1% about or so to about 44. So, you know, according to the Minister of State of Petroleum's logic, will we now see another increase in PMS about a week from now following this increase that we've just seen from the appreciation in crude oil to what the OPEC plus technical meeting just said? So, you know, that's, that's essentially what, uh, what our update is about uh, with respect to what's been going on. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't tally. I mean, you're very spot on, and, and that's why I, I first challenged that argument when I saw it. And I also want to even add the fact that even if it was a presumptuous, uh, you know, uh, move to be able to increase that, to be able to balk the price, maybe when it finally goes on, I'll still go back to that PwC report that says we've hit peak oil already, and there might not be any very dynamic change in crude oil prices. And also, I also like to hold the minister accountable by asking him that when the last increase happened, dear minister talked about um, 
He talked about auto gas, CNG gas. He talked about the fact that they're going to be installing new engines in people's cars to be able to use CNG gas. That's about 60 percent the price of the current price of uh, petrol in the market. We've not seen those updates. I don't know if the updates have started. Uh, uh, Rotus, has your engine been changed to be able to use auto gas in your car? No, uh, CNG, I think it's compressed natural gas. Yeah, that, that's not, that hasn't happened. And look, Rufai, I'm, I, I'm not sure if you're being sarcastic, but, but, but the amount of time it takes um, to your point to make those conversions with the number of cars, I think the MBS last report about the number of cars moving on Nigeria is about 11 point something million or so. So if you think about what much time it would take and the cost of switching from the petrol-based engines to using CNG, I mean, it's going to be pretty expensive and it's going to take some time. Uh, per switch. <laughs> that's, that's just I want perfect. to draw your attention to something uh, that is not your uh, main concern, but uh, which uh, I think is of interest. If you could show the minister's uh, uh, picture again, I thought I saw something on the lapel of his suit, which looked like uh, which looked like President Buhari's uh, picture. So do people now go about with uh, President Buhari's, uh, uh, you know, picture? I mean, Chief Timiro is Silva uh, is a very uh, distinguished and enlightened man, but uh, as he joined the cult of personality, the last time we witnessed this was uh, under military rule. I haven't, been to, be, I haven't been to Abuja for some time, but if people are now going about wearing uh, uh, President Buhari's uh, picture on their, on their chest, that's a, that's a very disturbing indication. It, it, I know, I know you are talking business, not politics. Yeah, yeah, I know, but. I know, well, of course. It could be, I mean, look, we should plug the uh, Arise Fashion Week uh, competition that's coming up. Uh, perhaps that's, maybe that's a new thing. You know, it could be a fashion thing to wear somebody's face on your lapel. Who knows? But uh, that, that is very interesting. An interesting observation, uh, Doctor. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that, Ruth. <laughs> Moving on to business of the Michael Wilson joins us now from London. Michael, pleasure talking to you. Yeah, morning. Um, the Moderna vaccine news then, that, that lifted Wall Street uh, quite considerably. S&P rising 1.17, Nasdaq up 2, and also the Dow about 1.5% as well. Um, in Asia, slightly more subdued, but the Nikkei 225, new 29-year high. Uh, and in China, the both the main markets there have eased very, very slightly. Now, the good thing about the vaccine, whatever we caution we have about vaccines, and of course, we have many cautions about it is that this one doesn't need to be kept in the sort of depths of sub-zero temperatures like the Pfizer one yesterday and of course the broader landscape we still have to hear from uh, AstraZeneca and so on so that there is a a, a lot of um, vaccine news coming it didn't actually wasn't quite as turbocharged as it was um, last week but nonetheless and here's something from markets all the way around the world that really I feel now and a lot of commentators do there has been a complete change in outlook. Um, optimism is much more palpable. There's much less pessimism from dull people like me. That, and I still am relatively pessimistic, but I'll, I hope I'm going to be proved wrong. I'll be agnostic, I think, is the way, is the way forward. Um, and we, ought to, we, we, we look as though we've got some kind of pathway to recovery. But that pathway will be a bumpy one. It's impossible not to ignore the vaccine news. But at the same time, here's what's actually happening. There are rising infection rates, hospitalisation, mortality rates too across Europe and in the United States, particularly California, being the latest state to pull an emergency break on 41 of its counties. That's 94 percent of its population. And remember, California is bigger than uh, a lot of um, uh, economies, country economies around the world. The fact that re remains that for all the optimism uh, over vaccine candidates. None is available to offset the, the, the problems that we're having right now. And as we head into what will be a long, dark winter, there's no question about that, in the northern hemisphere, um, it'll be very, very difficult to keep that under control. Now, Joe Biden and trade. You remember I was talking yesterday about the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, that snappily named uh, tidying up, really, of eight years of bilateral and multilateral negotiations with an enormous cast list of, of countries, but not the United States. Interesting, therefore, that Joe Biden has just said, or said yesterday, to work with other democracies, he's said, to, to try to rewrite 
um, rewrite what's actually happening as far as international trade is concerned. There are 15 Asia-Pacific countries, uh, including China, in, in that pact. And um, it, it, it does actually show, does it not, that uh, the United States is not the only game in town when it comes to trade. Here, the UK, Brexit talks rumble on. We're being softened up, I feel, for a deal at some stage, but these dates move away. Um, there was... The chief negotiator, David Frost, is quoted in today's newspapers of having said back in 2016 that the UK would be forced into compromise and thus the ball, it tends to be in the EU's court. We'll see about that. Now, you were talking about oil prices earlier. So Moderna, Moderna certainly helped that and, hurt, and certainly helped a lot of asset classes too. Um, oil had already rallied in Asia uh, after some robust regional data. And the OPEC plus technical panel you were talking about earlier, the Verotas were talking about earlier in the programme, uh, recommended to delay its planned output uh, boost by three to six months, meaning Brent crude over $44 a barrel. Um, gold spiked lower after the Moderna announcement. You'd expect that as well because people are feeling... Um, quite uh, happy or optimistic about things and therefore gold being usually the kind of thing that people buy when they're not feeling very happy and they're feeling a bit risk averse and um, that, that's gone away for the moment. The big figures today really US retail sales um, been absolutely quite strong. We've seen five months of fairly solid gains um, in, in retail sales and despite though there are, despite that, there are still big concerns, I think, about the US economy. I count nine million more American citizens out of work. And the sharp decline, I'll give you that, um, of the unemployment rate to 6.9% should be quite good. But is it masking what's actually going on in the labour market? We won't know that really until we get more uh, statistics towards the end of the year. That's the global view. Good morning. Right. I mean, very interesting points there. But I, I want to really pick on uh, the Moderna vaccine. It looks as though all of a sudden, after the Pfizer announcement, everybody now is churning out a vaccine that they say will work. For me, the question is this. Will the news of this vaccine start to reduce the inflation caused, about quant caused by quantitative easing that has been happening all this while during the coronavirus pandemic? A lot of countries... America, Britain, where you are, they have been printing money in steroidal proportions, for lack of a better word. Will this news start to trickle down the inflation when the inflation numbers come out? No, it won't, uh, because you, you have, in order to have inflation, you have to have some sort of demand as well. And so far, the massive amounts of quantitative easing that you're referring to have not resulted in inflation. And indeed, if they did, uh, then people would be relatively happy about it because it would be fairly small. So that's that. As far as um, the, the vaccines are concerned, still a long way to go. Uh, there are more of them than there were, certainly, but getting those vaccines to people, it's going through stringent testing. It is a, They are a long, long way away. And as I was saying, as far as the Northern Hemisphere is concerned, we're heading into a cold, dark winter. So there still will be tier um, regulations and lockdowns. In other words, local districts, local cities, not just in the UK, but in Germany, France, Spain and so on. So Europe is heading to a, a very difficult winter. And the big, big one is this, that even if, even if tomorrow a magic amount of vaccine arrived in various countries, what would the social unrest would be like? What would, what would people around the world be actually saying right now? That's the question to ask yourself. Would they be saying, oh, yeah, OK, so there's a vaccine over there, but we'll carry on in lockdown. I don't think they will. I think they'll be saying, and I want it now. Thanks very much indeed. And so, I, you know, th th there's all sorts of concerns about that. And it'll be down to pol politicians are going to have to handle this very, very carefully indeed. And of course, the thing we were talking about last week is, will it be compulsory? You know, there are big, big questions about all this. So, yes, a bit of optimism. It's a bit more probable than it was last week, but a long, long way to go. Michael, well, quickly, uh, Saudi Aramco, the world's uh, biggest oil farm, has just uh, announced uh, uh, a jumbo bond uh, sale uh, to fund about 75 billion uh, uh, dividends. Uh, how significant is that, or uh, is just a routine process? 
No, Saudi, Saudi Aramco is, is a major mover as far as investors are concerned. And if you remember, it was going to list in London and then it didn't. Uh, and it is still a major player. I still feel as though it whilst, you know, one is investing in these kind of stocks rather than oil itself, you still need to bear in mind the fact that our, OPEC Plus, I don't think, is a player. I mean, it will say it is, and, and I faithfully reported what it had said about the oil price, and it seems to have kind of worked. It's pushed it above $40 a barrel. It's $44 a barrel. It's Brent, Brent crude is. But the fact of the matter is that oil, there's plenty of oil around. There's plenty of oil floating around in tankers looking for ports right now around the world, and it, it will be demand that, it, that effectively seals the level of the oil price, not what OPEC says. Well, thank you very much, uh, Michael Wilson. We'll see you again tomorrow morning. Thank you. All right, uh, for an update on COVID-19 pandemic, I just want more rise here with us. I just want the pleasure having you. Thank you very much, Rufai. Good morning, everyone. Dr. Batitsundu and Rufai. I mean, there are at least 7 billion people in the world, so you can understand why the news of a potential vaccine will grab the headlines. You guys have been talking about the Moderna vaccine all morning, and I can imagine why. But first, uh, let's quickly look at the global figures this morning. We are inching close to 55 million cases. Oh, wow, we've hit it. So it's 50, over 55 million cases already this morning. This is a live tally by the Johns Hopkins University. And we've also crossed the 1.3 million death mark. Uh, so cases are surging globally, uh, cases of infections and death. And then back to that news that everybody's talking about. We have what is the most effective potential vaccine yet. Its effectiveness rate is said to be at 94.5%. Uh, what do we know about the Moderna vaccine and how does it compare to its contemporaries so far? Uh, talking about the Moderna vaccine now. Well, Moderna, an American biotech company, developed its vaccine candidate in collaboration with the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious infectious diseases and enrolled 30,000 participants in its uh, late stage trial, which is phase three, out of which there were 95 incident. A further breakdown shows that 90 cases of infections were recorded in the placebo group and the other five cases were observed in the vaccine group, which resulted in its estimated efficacy of 94.5%. So its effectiveness is higher than the Pfizer-BioNTech, which is at 90%, and the Russian Sputnik V, which is at 92%. Uh, from the preliminary data and information made known by Moderna, the jab ticks the right boxes so far. And let me tell you why. It recruited a substantial representation of what we refer to as people most at risk by this virus. Uh, we hear there were 37% of volunteers from those from minority communities. 47% of the volunteers also had other conditions or ages that puts them at risk. And of course, men outnumbered the women in the ratio of 53% to 47%. Uh, the jab is very appealing because of its shelf life. Uh, it can be stored in a conventional freezer for up to six months, making it much easier to store and transport than the BioNTech uh, jab. Also, uh, a similarity between these vaccines that we know so far is that they both use the uh, messenger RNA uh, technology. What this does is that it sends a messenger sequence to your cell, triggering it uh, to break down many more cells that can identify the virus when it wants to attack. So it is new, it is novel, I must say, just like the virus we're trying to fight. And there are no existing vaccines that use this kind of technique. Uh, Moderna is also more expensive than the Pfizer uh, jab. Now, Moderna is $38, uh, while Pfizer is at $20 a jab. But countries are liberty to have uh, prices cuts when they make bulk purchases. It's a, an exciting, important milestone that we have here. But there are still questions to be asked, such as uh, how long is the immunity? How often do we have to get boosters? And you remember, 
even though Moderna works in all ages, as we have been told, remember those five cases I told you about in the trial uh, stages? They did not tell us who those five people are, if they are older people or younger people, but it's not enough to inject uh, you know, a damper in the excitement that we all are feeling at this time. And there have been re reactions globally to this news. An ecstatic President Trump tweeted, and he says that historians should remember President Trump, yes, that tweet he said historians should remember under whose administration this feat was recorded. Um, in contrast, President-elect Joe Biden called the vaccine news really encouraging, but warns that more people may die unless the Trump administration starts cooperating with his incoming administration. Now, the WHO boss, Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus, has also said this news is very encouraging, but he is also worried about complacency as cases are surging globally. He also says those countries uh, that are letting the virus run without being checked are playing with fire. I heard you talk to the NCDC boss here in Nigeria asking him if Nigeria has made purchases. Now we are relying on COVAX, which is, which is a, a, a cooperation, an alliance by the um, Gavi Alliance and some other uh, donor agencies to help low-income countries, low- and middle-income countries also have access. Talking about equitable distribution, really, that's what COVAX is all about. But there's a scramble for doses. Just yesterday, the UK got at the back of the line and was able to purchase only 5 million doses, which comes to about 2.5 uh, million people because you need two jabs of these vaccines. Uh, it is predominantly pre-ordered by the US because it is a US company. So politically, the US is on top. And of course, financially, because it was a part of Operation Warp Speed. So the US has 100 million doses. As I've said, the UK had 5 million doses. The EU, uh, we here, is sealing a deal today to get some numbers of those doses. We don't know how many. But also yesterday, the EU President uh, von der Leyen also said, Ursula von der Leyen said that the EU has sealed its sixth contract for a vaccine. Yesterday, they purchased 405 million doses of another experimental coronavirus vaccine developed by a German biotech firm. That vaccine is called the CureVac. The European Union has 450 million populations. Uh, the, the virus is, is ravaging the continent, and they are leaving no stone unturned there. Well, I mean, our concern is uh, what is Nigeria doing? What is uh, West Africa doing? Uh, there is some kind of uh, initiative at the West African level and also at the African level. But even if we don't talk about the AU, how about ECOWAS, uh, where Nigeria is one of those countries providing, the, uh, providing leadership? I would have loved to see the kind of step that uh, the EU is taking, which is for 50 million uh, people. Well, I mean, uh, Dr. Eko, as you say, is, well, we're, we're working towards something, but that's not very clear. Apart from the COVAS alliance, which is more like depending on charity, there was also uh, at a point uh, some discussion with Pfizer uh, representatives in Nigeria and the assurance that Nigeria will be able to get uh, equitable access to the uh, vaccine. But what we have seen with the example of EU and the UK is that countries make down payment. I hope at some point we'll be able to uh, know uh, whether Nigeria is going to make down payment for the vaccines, because you also have to queue up. The UK may not be able to have access to that vaccine until maybe uh, the uh, later part of next year. And if you queue up, uh, countries like uh, uh, developing countries like ours may not even get onto that queue till maybe uh, 2022. And where does that leave us? Uh, just in case there is uh, a second wave and we are faced with, uh, you know, an emergency. All right. In all of this, I look forward to a day where we will be able to boldly say Nigerian scientists have worked on a vaccine and they've gotten something out up and running. I mean, I look forward to that day, too. I uh, recall that Nigeria made her intentions known. I remember that communication between the office of the vice president. Uh, we made our intentions known, but beyond intentions, I don't know what we have done. Anyway, thank you. All right, thank this you so much.